This is the first episode of a series I'm doing on Dune. So when I was in sixth grade, the Dune movie came out, David Lynch's Dune. And uh, I liked it. I, you know, I, I, really, I, I, I still like that movie. And uh, I remember the time that came out, a couple of things happened. I got the, the comic book. Right, he had a three-part. Uh, it's by Bill Sinkovitz. He, he illustrated the, uh, using the movie, he made a series of comics from Marvel Comics. Uh, the, the novelization, the graphic novelization, the comic book edition of the movie. So I had number one, I still have it somewhere, of uh, his series on, on Dune with the, you know, the, the David Lynch, Kyle MacLachlan movie. And uh, I took it to school and I was, I was looking at it. This, this other kid came up. I believe this is sixth, perhaps seventh grade. I think it was sixth grade, though. And this kid comes up. Oh, wow, that's your, you got Dune. I, you know, I like Dune, too. And this other kid came up. I was like, what is that? Oh, it's that movie. That's the worst movie I ever saw in my whole life. That's terrible. I hated Dune. And the other kid says, well, I, I can't speak to the, the film, but I read the book, and the book is, is good. The other thing that happened around that time was they actually, I remember going to, some store and they had the action figures for Dune. And my mother was with me. She said, well, I guess they thought that was going to be a bigger hit than it was because it, the movie didn't succeed in the United States. But I, I liked it and I actually, I guess in middle school, I read the books. I read the Dune novel, then I read Dune Messiah, and then I read Children of Dune. I actually read God Emperor of Dune. There's two more books uh, written by Frank Herbert after that, which is Heretics of Dune and then Chapter House of Dune. And uh, he was working on Dune 7, as he called it, and uh, his son, I think it's Kevin Anderson, a science fiction writer, and his son, Brian Herbert, got a hold of the three-page outline, and they wrote two books. <laughs> it's supposed to be one novel, probably trying to milk it for everything they can get out of it. <laughs> they, they divided it into two books. I think it's called Hunters of Dune and uh, Sandworms of Dune. And... Based on what I, I, I haven't read Heretics of Dune all the way through or Chapter House Dune. I haven't read these books yet, but I've seen like overviews and, and, and plot synopsises. And uh, most of what's in, in Hunters of Dune and Sandworms of Dune, uh, it, it brings a culmination resolution to the story. And a lot of it rings true, but some people think, and I agree with them, that uh, Kevin Anderson and uh, Brian Herbert have taken liberties. And this is more of their book, and they're not staying true to Frank Herbert's outline. Uh, mostly with these two uh, characters that Frank Herbert discussed in earlier books that they, they make into thinking machines. So they went back, and what he's, what, what, what's going on is Brian Herbert's trying to take ownership of his father's heritage, you know, that he wrote Dune. He's trying to to own it and and uh, I guess make, make money off of it. I don't know if that's necessarily that's a, a bad thing, but I think that uh, I think people don't like certain liberties that he's taken. And uh, Brian Herbert's books are, are looked at uh, by the, the fans as apocryphal, and some people are very skeptical about his two books. But I think that he did take some liberties, but I think that most of like Duncan Idaho – becomes the main character, and he becomes the ultimate Kowitz Hatterack. In the end, you have Golas or uh, clones that retain the, all the memories of Paul and Chani, you know, living happily ever after. So I think most of that, of what they, they did, is true to the outline. But we can't really know for sure unless they publish the actual outline. And they, they had, like, CDs that, seemed to, that contained the documents on it. So there's, they do seem to be in possession of the outline, but some people are distrustful of them because of the liberties that they're, they're taking with it. So I want to talk about Dune and uh, what just happened. First you have how I came across Dune was through the, the David Lynch movie, right? David Lynch's 1984 Dune. And there are different versions of this movie. Uh, we're just going to talk about three important versions. Is uh, They did a TV version and then there's something called the, the Spice Rider Fan Edit. Um, so you actually had three um, sci-fi channel did a miniseries where they adapted Dune, Dune Messiah, and Children of Dune. And their goal was to be 
as faithful uh, to the the source text as possible. But I I believe there are certain embellishments that David Lynch uh, added to his movie, but. Frank Herbert was involved with David Lynch's Dune. He loved it. He talks about it. He praises it in his book entitled I, which is a collection, I Like Your Eyeball, a collection of short stories and essays that he wrote. And uh, he was involved in the 1984, uh, Frank Herbert, the author himself, and he sang its praises. So he liked it. He was involved with it. And there are certain ideas in the David Lynch, Lynch's version that he incorporated to later Dune novels. Like when I read, uh, I read the book, it didn't, I don't think it said anything about folding space, but David Lynch says the spice enable, it, 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 they need to, the, the navigators need to have uh, spice to be able to navigate uh, through you know, interstellar, interstellar space travel. But it doesn't talk about folding space, but David Lynch used that terminology and then he wrote it into, uh, Frank Herbert wrote it into his letter, uh, so he made it canon, right? So, uh, back to David Lynch's uh, Dune. Yeah, the theatrical cut. Apparently, he filmed like a four to five hour long movie, but they got it down to two hours and, and 17 minutes for the 1984 release. And uh, the TV version added like 40 minutes. And then more additional footage was also uh, released. In a, in a DVD. So we have the Spice Rider fan ed edit, and his last edition was from, uh, sorry, it's from 2012. And uh, what do I think? Well, the TV, uh, th there's certain things that belong in the movie. I don't know why they cut out, so it's good to see the restored footage in the TV version. But uh, this, it's, it's, I didn't like the, the, uh, the new intro they tacked on which was a series of paintings with narration uh i didn't like it uh but i gotta say spice rider this is probably right now the definitive version of the movie but then there are certain things that that spice rider did is he did not use all the the footage so i, I guess that's good this is his vision what he thinks is the best way uh, to effectively tell the story. He selected the best and most effective deleted scenes in his view. But what I didn't understand, there's a scene, the, the infamous, uh, the jock strap that Sting wears. He comes out of a steam room wearing nothing but his jock strap. And uh, uh, my father took me to see Dune. He was offended by this scene where Baron Harkin is like, uh, gawking at Sting. And uh, that scene also has Raban barging in in that same scene. And he there's a cow hanging down. And he rips the tongue out. It's a, it's a dead cow. It's being dismembered by dwarfs. And he's chewing on it. And, he, you know, Baron Harkon is telling him to crush the, the, the freeman, crush Arrakis. And he gives a diabolical laugh. And then he, like, storms out. And he pushes down over one of the, uh, the dwarfs dismembering this... Uh, this cow, and, and the spice, the spice writer uh, edit, he gets rid of one of the the diabolical laughs, and he deletes the scene where Raban knocks over one of the dwarfs. It's like, I understand it. So he's he's making some strange. I think he should have left that scene alone, but he fixed, he refined a lot of special effects. So uh, this is a. a, a I don't know if it, right now it's the definitive. I think that it needs to be re-edited. David Lynch has renounced his Dune movie, but he's now he's finally opened the possibility of re-editing it. And that would be the best thing is for the movie uh, studio to uh, sponsor uh, David Lynch himself uh, editing it and refining it and correcting the special effects and things like that to come up with a better quality product. Now, some people say that uh, well, a lot of the, the extra footage, the five-hour version, all this was uh, there's a fire at Universal Studios uh, archives, and they're claiming that supposedly everything is burned up, but we we still have the footage, right? Spice Rider used it, and it was on TV, and, and there's probably 15 minutes of deleted scene that Spice Rider didn't use. I think somebody should just put all the footage together because 
it was together. That's how David Lynch did it in his rough cuts. And uh, I, the issue for me now, of course, you have the, the sci-fi version of the, 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 the first three books uh, of the series. But now we got Denis. It looks like Venice Villanueva, but he's not. He's French Canadian. He's not uh, uh, Hispanic, so it's. I think it's Vinny Villanue. Uh, but now he's done Dune, and then he did Dune Part Two, and I'm going to talk about it uh, in in another program. But there's problems. There's a lot of problems, especially with Chani, because he has Chani. And at the end of the movie, Chani's enraged and she storms out, and it's like. You can't do that. You can't do that. Chani is the mother of Duke Leto II, the God Emperor of Doom. <laughs> you know, he's not. That's not true to the book. They accuse David Lynch of taking liberties in the book, and he. This is once you watch. If you watch, if you read the novel, you watch David Lynch's version. You watch the sci-fi version. It's this, and even even uh, Denise's version. Uh, they're all essentially just different. Uh, Developments, I guess, or retellings of the same story. So, just recently, <laughs> this is kind of funny. Uh, Denise, like, when he was making D Dune 2, it's like, I'm going to make a trilogy. I'm making a trilogy. I'm going to do Dune Part 1, Part 2, and I'm going to do Dune Messiah. I'm going to tell the whole story of Paul Atreides from Rise to, well, he, he's blinded by a nuclear explosion. And uh, he loses his psychic powers, and he goes off to the desert. But, see, Dune Messiah is about... The, in, the, in the end of Dune, you know, if you read it, I think most people look at this as... A, you know, he's, he's like a Messiah figure, a Christ figure, almost. But the second one is kind of a correction on this idea. And we, we see that, that Paul might be sincere and well-meaning, but he's a failed Messiah. Uh, even though it wasn't his intent, atrocities were committed in his name. So he's failed as Messiah. And uh, he actually redeems himself by taking the proper role as a prophet and becoming the preacher, which is more explored in the, the final book of this first trilogy. But of course, we don't have a trilogy. We have six books in the, 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 the Dune series culminating with <laughs> the, the addition of the Dune 7 uh, by his son and uh, Kevin Anderson. So, once Dune, 2, Dune Part 2 became successful, this Denise, like, while he was filming Dune Part 2, it's like, I'm going to do Dune Messiah. It's going to be done. And uh, he gave a copy of the novel to Hans Zimmer. Like, we're going to do this. I want you to do the, uh, the whole team. We're going to finish the first three books, the initial trilogy. And then once Dune 2 becomes successful, he says, I don't know. I don't know about this. I think I'm going to take a oh, three to five year break. And I, I, don't, I, don't, I might not even make the movie at all. I think this is just negotiating techniques because once the movie's successful, and there's a lot of movies losing money, right? And we got Disney destroying big franchises. Once you have a successful series, Dune Messiah is going to be made. And Denny committed to making Dune Messiah. He's not going to do Children of Dune or the rest of the series. He says those are too esoteric, esoteric, and he's not going to sorry esoteric. He's not going to uh, do those. Uh, but I want to talk about this other video. Uh, unfortunately, Denis Villeneuve has an animus towards uh, religious faith, and he also de-Arabized and de-Islamicized. Uh, Dune, which I think is awful, but we'll talk about that later. I, I got to admit, I have issues with Denise, Dune, and Dune Part 2, but as films are good, I just don't think he's being faithful to source material in certain pivotal ways. So, <laughs> the studio is not going to slow walk Dune Messiah. They need, they're in it, it's a business. They're in it to make money, and this is becoming a successful franchise. And even though he's not going to do it, they're going to do Children of Dune. They're going to do God Emperor of Dune. They're going to do Heretics of Dune. And they're going to do Chapter House of Dune. Chapter House Dune. And they're probably going to do Dune 7. Right? 
I mean, they're in it to make money. If they have the rights to this, it's going to happen. And he's going to do the first three, and they're going to have to uh, find a, uh, a new director for the rest of the series. Um, but one of the issues is why they can't slow walk it is because we have Jason Momoa. Jason Momoa is 44 years old now. So he's about middle age. And we just talked about how in Dune 7 or, or 8... And I, I think this is faithful. I can see this in his, to Frank Herbert's intent. I think that, that Duncan Idaho, the character that Jason Momoa plays, did become the ultimate Kowitz Haderach. I can see that. Because you see the development of certain ideas that culminates to the story. So even though they took some liberties, I think that there's a lot that is faithful to, to, uh, to Frank Herbert's vision in uh, Hunters of Dune and uh, uh, Sandworms of Dune, Dune 7. I wish they just did their best to reflect his original vision. They didn't, but I think essentially they did remain at, uh, faithful to his uh, uh, his plans. Uh, so, you know, Duncan Idaho, he's not in Dune Part Two, but he's in all the rest of the stories. And uh, how long is it going to take them to get to uh, to Dune Seven? You know, if you have two or three years between each movie. Uh, by the time he gets to the last movie, it's very possible that Jason Momoa could be 60 years old. So, uh, if they're going to make all these Doom movies, they got to get cracking, and they can't wait on... Uh, they, they appeased him. It's like, I guess he wants to make a, a movie about nuclear war. He says, okay, you do, we're going to start production on Dune Messiah now. We're not going to wait. We're, gonna, <laughs> we're at business. We're here to make money. And this is the last movie you're doing. We're going to develop the other in the series. Uh, and we can't hold up. This is successful. You need to hit it while it's, while it's hot. And uh, so let's, let's move this into production. And uh, if you want to make this up, the movie, we'll give you money for it. But you're going to do Dune Messiah first. So I'm going to talk more about Dune uh, in, in other programs. I'm going to do a series about Dune. This is kind of a... I like Dune, and even though there's certain things, I I, I got to admit, I have issues with uh, uh, Denny Villeneuve's uh, Dune, but I, I think they are. I mean, they're, I got to admit, they're good movies. I just have issues. I think like uh, it's outrageous, outrageous. Now, in the Dune universe, they're not they're they're Zen Sunnis, right? This is a new hybrid religion uh, of Zen Buddhism and. Uh, Sunni Islam coming to form a new religion. And they are Arabic speakers. This is an Arabic culture. It's different than anyone we know today. Uh, it's derived from, and this is a future conjectural future. Uh, so it's not true Islam. It's Buddhism mixed with Islam. I don't know how, you, how that would work, but that's something that, that uh, Frank Herbert came up with. Uh, so changing their language from Arabic, and the funny thing is, you know, I've lived in the Middle East. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not really... Uh, I don't believe in the so-called Prophet Muhammad. I don't believe in the Quran, but this is a work of literature, and I think you should be faithful to his his uh, vision and, and respectful of Arabic culture. Uh, it's kind of funny. It's like you watch these watch these movies like Iron Man and uh, True Lies, and I can pick up some when they're speaking in Arabic. I can pick up some of what they're saying, and uh, I can understand some of the things in Dune, like they say. <laughs> Lasana al Gabe. And in Aramaic, Lasana is, is language or tongue or voice, I guess, which is it's all related. Uh, so you should be true. If it's a Semitic language you're speaking, I think it's outrageous that they hired a linguist to, to change it. Uh, it's, it's very disrespectful of Arab culture and the Semitic culture for them to have done that. It's outrageous. I mean, it's easy. I mean, there's all kinds of Arabic speakers today. They could have easily got, instead of constructing an artificial language, just use the, the Arabic the way uh, Frank Herbert did. Uh, so that, that, that's one thing that, that bothers me. Uh, they, they, they're trying to de-Arabize it. Uh, but the, the thing is, though, I mean, I can tell. I live in the Middle East. So when I hear Arabic, I, I can recognize it. But, but what's the point of creating the, the, the false language? Because to somebody who's not familiar with Arab culture or the Middle Eastern cultures, you, you hear that and... Uh, it's going to sound like Arabic to them anyway. So what's the point? People, non-Arabic speakers will assume because 
uh, the, the Arabic cultural aspects of the Freeman culture is, are pretty obvious. And they're meant to be. That's, that's what Frank Herbert created. So, I, um, I understand you're adapting a different media, literature, to a different art form, film. And, you know, like, there's certain things in David Lynch's film were not in the book, like heart plugs. And there's a lot of things in David, uh, in uh, Denise, <laughs> that aren't in the book, too. Uh, but I think you should be uh, as faithful as possible, uh, at least the spirit of, of the text. So I think, I think Dune, especially the first novel, is a, is a great piece of literature. It's, very, it's been influential, impactful, and inspirational to, to me. I don't know why do I like Dune. Why do I still like it? I don't that, that 84 Dune. I don't know. Uh, but I, I, I got the, like I said, I, read, I was in middle school. I read the book. I still have the graphic uh, well, it's the, uh, I got the, the first comic, but then I, they had a paperback size, full color graphic novel, uh, adaptation of the movie. And I got, I got that. I still have that. I got rid of my doom books because, uh, at that time I realized I needed to focus on the gospels and the Bible and scriptures. And, uh, doom was becoming a distraction for me focusing on my proper spiritual development. And as a Christian, I don't agree with all of, uh, Frank Herbert's ideas, but on the other hand, I'm a Republican, and so was uh, Frank Herbert. And uh, David Lynch has had uh, uh, Republican sim 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 sympathies. <laughs> he loved he loved Ronald Reagan. Uh, I think Ronald Reagan was one of the best presidents we ever had in America. So, uh, but uh, David Lynch kind of likes the the macabre and the grotesque. <laughs> and you read these books, which I'm going to talk about more books in, in uh, further episodes. Uh, they, they say that David Lynch loved uh, Giddy Prime and the Harkonnen culture, <laughs> which I can see. Now, with David Lynch's other works, I like Twin Peaks, season one and two, even the micro series, the uh, coffee commercial micro, micro series, and uh, uh, Dune 3. Uh, sorry, not Dune 3, I'm talking about uh, season three of Twin Peaks. I like Twin Peaks. I watched the whole thing. And I wanted to see. Agent Cooper in his right mind for one full episode, <laughs> and you didn't get it. Uh, and but just like the Villanueva's movies, uh, even though there are certain aspects, I was disappointed in in uh, Twin Peaks Part Three. It's actually overall, even though I was disappointed in the fact that we didn't get enough uh, Agent Cooper. It's it was a good culmination uh, and continuation of the series. Uh, but those are the only things that, of David Lynch that I really... I saw The Elephant Man is a good movie. But uh, I do respect David Lynch, but I'm not... You know, I haven't seen all of his works except for Dune and Twin Peaks, uh, both with Kyle MacLachlan and, uh, uh, of course, Elephant Man as well. But one thing I want to see is I want to see the expanded version of David Lynch's Dune because it's better than, uh, in a lot of ways, than uh, Denis' version. And... Uh, uh, I think we need to get that out there. And uh, Max Every wrote a new book uh, called A Masterpiece in Disarray, which I'd recommend. I actually have The Making of Dune that was published with the movie. I got that years ago because I'm a Dune fan. It's probably a rare book now, but I, you know, I'm reading through it. <laughs> I'll conclude with this. But uh, Max Avery found the screenplay that David Lynch was writing I only finished halfway through for Dune Messiah. I think that's very, very interesting. <laughs> but I'm reading this uh, this book about the making, uh, Max Avery's and the, uh, was it Mr. Naha's book on the making of Dune that I have? <laughs> but they filmed in the desert outside of Juarez. I've been to Juarez uh, in Mexico years ago before it became so bad. Uh, <laughs> but, but they're wearing these still suits. They're sweating like crazy. And it's like, why didn't they, they, they should have filmed in the, Fall, winter, and spring in Mexico when the weather is not so hot. I don't know why they go out there. Look, I traveled around the Middle East a lot. And when I, when I go to the Middle East, going out in the desert regions, I travel in Egypt and other places, Syria, Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon is not. Lebanon is a coastal area. It's beautiful. Uh, but it's Arab country. Uh, but when I travel the Middle East, I go in the fall, the winter, and the spring. I don't travel the Middle East. I mean, I was there for the war in Iraq, in the blazing hot summer. When I'm doing my one of my research tours and you just go and visit friends, I don't go in the middle of the blazing summer. So I don't understand why they, they film these. You should 
plan these, plan accordingly. You know the weather. If you're going to be wearing these suits like that, I mean, of course, the concept is still suits. One thing I like about Villanueva's version is he's, uh, they're supposed to be wearing robes and, uh, uh, like in I, uh, by Frank Herbert, E-Y-E, you, you see on the cover uh, how the still suits are portrayed uh, in the novel, where it's traditional Arabic attire, but you have this suit that helps the body retain water and stay cool. But of course, we don't have that technology now, so these these costumes make you blazing hot, since you know they're just approximating just the, the appearance of something that uh, maybe we could develop some technology about that, that like that. That'd be amazing, but. Uh, uh, those poor actors and a lot of the Mexican extras and, and I guess, uh, American extras uh, suffered. Uh, a lot of people from El Paso apparently uh, uh, put on the still, still suits. Several people just passed out. When I was in Iraq, uh, it gets cold in Iraq, too, uh, in, in the winter. But it gets so hot in the summer, we're talking about 130 degrees. We had one of our soldiers that, that died, had a heat stroke and died. Uh, he wasn't one of my units, but he was on my base. And uh, I, the poor guy was from Alaska, and he just couldn't handle <laughs> what he's acclimatized to. It's just too much a shock to the system, and he he died in the heat in Iraq. Um, and that's the other thing, <laughs> Iraq, Iraqus. Uh, <laughs> it's how he played with these these words. Uh, and I I loved Iraq. I spent years of my life there. Um, uh, you know, yes, I was there for, during a war and carnage, but uh, amazing country and. Uh, uh, most of the people there are very good people. So, if you're interested in Dune, um, just watch for the program as I do literary analysis and film criticism on Dune. So, yes, I'm taking my theological pursuits very seriously, but I've been under a lot of stress. And, uh, like, when I was going to college, I, my last semester, I was working real hard. I read all through, I grew up on Dune, Narnia, and The Lord of the Rings. When I was a kid, the cartoon version by Ralph Baskey came out, and uh, you know I loved that. Except some of the rotoscoping was bad, but that's also a uh, masterpiece in disarray. You know, you watch the Mount Ralph Baskey movie; it's a good film, but there's certain, uh, like the Balrog scene, the orcs. Overall, it's good, but there's it's, it's got some problems. That's a lot of people see the, the Dune movie the same way. But uh, about Ralph Baskey's movie, if you watch that or you grew up on it the way I did. Uh, Peter Jackson. There's certain scenes he recreated shot from shot from the the original animated Ralph Baskey version. Ralph Baskey adapted just the first two novels, and then someone did a really poor job on concluding that series with the Return of the King. Um, so yeah, stay tuned for if you're interested in Dune. Uh, stay tuned for other episodes. I want to do a book review of Max Avery's book, uh, A Masterpiece in Disarray, and uh, I'm almost finished that book. I had it for a long time. The uh, uh, by Ed Neha, is that his name? Uh, the Making of Dune, about the 1984 picture. Uh, and I'm going to unload on uh, Denis Villeneuve. Uh, I'm going to talk about what I like about it and what I don't like. And and uh, as a Christian and someone who believes that uh, spirituality is important, I watched uh, Denis Villeneuve's movie, Arrival, which I thought was garbage. Uh, the way he mocks faith, Christian faith, and he's doing it with this movie, too. Uh, I, I think it's appalling. And I don't think that was that's what Frank Herbert's about. Of course, Frank Herbert's warning the, the, the danger of a messianic figure and how faith could be misused, but I don't think he's uh, demeaning and attacking religion and faith, it's just showing his positive and his negative aspects. But uh, uh, Denis Villeneuve, he's got some kind of animus against religion. Uh, I don't know what his problem is, but uh, uh, the thing is, like, when you write science fiction, you know, people uh, in Hollywood and literary circles <laughs> put these books out there. It's like people from all walks of life are reading it, even people you despise, like, you know, people in the country, religious folks, Bible thumpers. They might be reading and watching Dune, too. And uh, <laughs> we're not a bunch of arrogant. Uh, you're arrogant in thinking that we're a bunch of ignorant hillbillies. Some, t some of us are as educated and sophisticated, maybe more so, uh, than you are. Uh, and so Denise got one of these... Uh, Bad attitude, and uh, I, I think it's it's disturbing that he's putting his hostility towards faith in, in these movies, especially in Dune Part Two, and and it's gonna be troubling to to see the.
Dune Messiah, when the book does uh, serve as a warning against, so you, have, so you have this Paul Atreides, this this messianic f figure of great potential, and David Lynch and also Jodorowsky. You know, this is a spiritual book. It's inspiring, you know. And yet the the follow-up is like, yeah, this guy he meant well. <laughs> He's a prospective Messiah, but he's a human being, and he fell short. And he has to redeem himself by becoming a preacher and renouncing power and, and serving as a preacher of God's word, not for power, glory, or control, but to speak the truth uh, earnestly and sincerely with, you know, renounce all worldly possessions and exist solely to preach the word of God. That's what Paul does in the end, and I think that's, uh, that's what Jesus calls us to do as well. So, join us for fur further episodes of my exploration of the Dune books and movies. Thank you, and God bless you.